The first session is a, uh, a very mild initiation to the vocabulary that is being used in our industry. Uh, now, when we start from scratch, I would say the usual question is where to start and where to finish. So probably for some of you, what I will share with you is something you know, you have heard before, you are totally at ease with. Maybe some people might uh, discover a few things, which is what I hope. But anyway, it will give you uh, some definitions which are commonly used in the world of uh, high voltage uh, overhead lines and insulators. I have divided this presentation in three sections. One which is general terms. Uh, you know, it's always nice to start with something general. So uh, we, we, we will go through some generic, very common terminologies. Then we are going to look at a few mechanical definitions and then to finish some electrical definitions. So general terms, um, just to start with, what you see here on the screen is typical arrangements of power lines. So on the left, you see a very tall tower, which is in this case a DC, uh, a DC line, but we'll go back to this later. But you see that there is an insulator string hanging vertically. This is what we call a suspension string, which sometimes you find with another term, which is I string. Why is it called I string? Because the letter I vertically definitely looks like the string of insulators that is hanging vertically. Now, when we are talking about suspension, you have other configurations of suspension strings which are possible. If you look at the picture at the top right, you see a double V-string. Now, V-string is obvious. The string looks like a V. This string is uh, doing exactly the same thing as the previous I-string, except that for mechanical reasons, for stability of the conductor, so the conductor is not shaking back and forth if you have wind, the conductors are held by two strings of insulators which are facing each other with an angle. So this will stabilize the conductors on that tower. It is a suspension string, which is also called V-string. On the same picture you see on the top, the top red arrow shows you a small cable that is on top of the tower. This is what we call a ground wire, also sometimes called shield wire. This small cable does two things. It ensures a common ground value all along the line. And if you have lightning during thunderstorms, this small wire is designed to take the lightning so it does not go on the conductors, but the lightning goes directly to the ground. This is one way that is commonly used to protect power lines from lightning. The picture you have here shows you that the cable, the ground wire, is relatively close to the vertical axis of the tower. The exact position of the ground wire is the result of electric field calculations in order to optimize the protection from lightning. Then the picture at the bottom shows you another configuration of uh, insulator strings. Sometimes when you look at the tower, you see that there are horizontal strings. If you follow a line, you will see that every five, six, or seven, or ten towers, depending what the line is, you will find a tower stronger, and you will see that the metal structure of the tower itself is more robust, and with insulator strings which are horizontal. These horizontal strings are called dead-end strings and also sometimes called tension strings. These strings exist because you want to make sure that if anything happens on the line, at some point in time, you're going to have a tower 
that will resist mechanically and not allow the entire line to collapse in what we call a cascading effect. So these towers are more robust. They are anchoring points along the line. And therefore, the insulators that are used in these strings usually have a higher mechanical strength than the suspension insulators, which suspension insulators only have to hold the weight of the conductors along the span, plus some wind, and eventually, if you are in cold climate, some ice. But a, a tension uh, structure, a tension string has to hold it, preventing mechanical failures. Now, when you look at such a, at, at such a tower, you see that you have one string at each side of the tower, which means your line is disconnected. There is no continuity from one side to the other. So you need to find a way around to make sure that your line is continuous. So you start from one side of the tower and you build a cable which goes down, as you can see, and comes back on the other side. This is what we call the jumper loop. And the vertical insulator string, which is between the two dead end strings, is what we call a jumper string. This jumper has only to support the weight of the small cable going from one side of the insulator string on one side of the tower to the other side on the other side of the tower. So not a lot of weight, but the jumper is there to bring stability to an anchoring structure. You have two types of power lines. Depending upon the type of current you want to transport on this transmission line. AC or DC lines exist simultaneously in a given country. The top left picture shows you a typical AC single circuit line. This is a line where you have three strings of insulators holding three sets of conductors. Why? Because AC current is three phases, as you can see in the middle uh, dr uh, little drawing, where you have an AC sinusoidal current multiplied by three, which are occurring at different times in a 50 hertz or 60 hertz cycle. This is the most traditional way to transport power. If you have more power to transport in AC, you will increase the voltage, but you can also create multiple circuit, like you can see the picture at the left bottom side, where you have one AC circuit here and one AC circuit here. That's what we call a double circuit. So you will find power lines which are single circuit, double circuit. It goes usually not beyond a quad circuit. There are only a few countries where you have very uh, high numbers of circuits on one uh, tower. So that's AC. It's a 50 hertz or 60 hertz current. Uh, typically on your outlet on the wall, you will get a 220 volt or a 110 volt AC. So to go from a power line that has high voltage to your outlet on your wall, you are cascading down the power with transformers. Now, if you have to carry power on a very long distance, and this is something which is really specialized for long distance transmission lines, you can use a DC line. This time you only have two sets of conductors. You have a positive pole and a negative pole. And on this line, the current is no longer oscillating like in AC. It is a stable, either positive or negative voltage. So this is strictly used when you have very long lines to build and you do not have anybody that will use this power on the route of the line. So typically a DC line is 600 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers long, but you are just generating the power on one side and distributing the power on the other side. In between, you only have a line. While on an AC line, you can have multiple substations which will distribute the power 
in the neighborhood on the route of the line. So two families of lines. AC lines are the most common power lines. DC, you have less DC lines existing around the world than AC line for one simple reason. They are only big highways when you have long distance. Now, if we look closer to an insulator, there are some words which are being used when people are looking at insulators. The shape, you have different shapes of insulators, as you can see at the right of this slide. On the top, you have what we call a standard shape. The second insulator has longer ribs, as you can see. It has the same shape, but longer ribs. This is an insulator that is used when you have an environment around the power line that has, for example, a coast with soil spray or dust, like you have in industrial or desertic environments. It is what we call a fog type. Now, since I was talking about desertic environments, you have usually in deserts dust and mostly nothing else but dust. And the idea of the third insulator from the top is a flat disc with no ribs. Why? Because if you have dust, dust is going to come on those insulators and the wind will clean up progressively as it goes the dust from the surface of the insulator. So it remains cleaner than if you had ribs where the dust is going to stay stuck between. This insulator is typically what is being used in desertic environments. But you have another style of insulator, which actually was initially used in China because of dust, dusty environments, mostly from industrial uh, environments, but at the same time with some humidity. So you need to have something on the insulator which gives you a better protection against arcing when you have wet conditions. This we'll talk about later when we will address pollution questions. But in this particular insulator, you see that the ribs are outside. They are not underneath. So this outer rib insulator, this is the name of this insulator, the outer rib insulator is actually having a long distance for the arc, which is what we call the leakage distance, but at the same time, we'll have ribs which will clean up easily with the wind because the ribs are outside and not underneath. So you have four different names for different shapes of insulators. The other word that is used when you are describing an insulator is the coupling. The coupling is the type of connection between two insulators. You see on the left a small sketch showing how two insulators are connected together in order to build a string. The most common coupling method worldwide is what we call a socket ball. And you see the, the insulators that is in the middle, it is what we call a socket ball. The top fitting is a socket in which you can put the pin, which is underneath the insulators that will be attached to it. The socket and the ball are classified by size and mechanical rating. So the couplings have numbers. And you see, for example, and you have two different standards worldwide which are covering those definitions. In IC, uh, you have couplings which have numbers like 16, 20, 24. In ANSI, the American standard, the couplings are referenced 52.5, 52.11. In the standard, you have description of every dimension of every socket and every ball of every type of coupling. And unfortunately, IEC and ANSI are not compatible. So if you have insulators which are used on the American market, you're going to use a shape of socket and ball that is different from what is being used anywhere else around the world, uh, which is using IC. So coupling 
is a word to describe the style of connection between two insulators in order to build an insulator string. Then there is another component. We forget this component very often. It is the one represented in the middle a sketch. It's a small cotter key which comes through a hole in the cap. And when you pull the cotter key inside the cap, it will secure the string of insulators so insulators cannot separate afterwards. This very small device is a safety device. It is actually the only safety device that exists on an insulator string. And the shape of this small cotter key will define how well the security of the string is maintained when you have wind, when you have all kinds of conditions on the line. This cotter key needs to be bended properly in the factory. And very often we forget that this small little operation where you bend the cotter key is the most critical from a mechanical point of view. If you have a string of insulator which cotter keys are not correctly inserted, you can drop a string which can be an extremely severe catastrophic event. So never forget a cotter key. It is very small, but it is extremely important. 